Hello, everyone. I'm going to wait for a few people to log on here. I only have about 15 minutes and wanted to share uh, something with you that here I am at the school um, that happened here at the school. So I have um, been back in the school doing programming and um, yeah, wanted to kind of share something with you. So come on, log on. I know many of you are at work, so um, my hair is tangled. <laughs> so it may not uh, be many of you that can come on. So come on, join me, join me real quick. Hurry up, hurry up. Come on, I need to tell you something. I need to tell you something. Wasn't, hey, Rod. Hey, Cornell, how you doing? How's our babies? I need to call, yeah. Hey, Kimberly. Okay, so I need about 10 more of you to come on real quick. Come on, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, so we can I can share this. It was a conversation that I had uh, with some young people. Uh, not one of my crying moments, right? So we won't need to do that today. But definitely wanted to share uh, something with you uh, that happened with some uh, grown, I know, right? <laughs> sure enough grown. I wanted to share with you that happened at the school today. So um, a part of what I do in my programming is talk to young people uh, just about, you know, what's going on in the world. And so uh, I asked them who had the opportunity to watch Obama's speech last night, um, which was awesome in itself. I'm sorry, y'all, this hair. Hallelujah. Um, so uh, to ask them who had the opportunity to watch Obama's speech last night. So in doing that, I also talked to them about the movie um, Hidden Figures. I'm like the little Bush girl. I keep saying hidden treasures, hidden fences. Lord Jesus, why did they give her the blues? Because she made a mistake. That was so wrong. So anyway, this is what happened. I'm talking about the movie. I'm sharing with them, you know, just kind of challenging them on some thoughts. When was the movie was made, um, was about these three African-American young women uh, in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, how they went to college, um, 14, 16, uh, in that age. And they all went to historically black colleges. And all three of them are part of the same sorority that I am a part of. And one of them, uh, the one that Taraji Peet plays, uh, graduated and pledged at the same university I did, Wilbur Force University. So I asked them just some questions. What was going on in the late 50s, early 60s during this time? They said segregation, racism, discrimination. I said, well, hey, Kimberly. I said, yeah, and today racism and discrimination still exists. Hello. Just had an interesting conversation. Uh, with the one of the assistant principals here. Um, and I think they have forgotten that. <laughs> hey, Sister Carmen. So, so, so I asked them, and so they answered that question. And then I said, and they were minorities. This is where, this is where the pen gets dropped. What's a minority? Yesterday, excuse me, yesterday, I saw about 160, no, about 180 young people yesterday in my programming. Hey, Sans. Hey. And um, today, I'll see equal that amount. Do you know that none of these young people knew what a minority was? They, don't, they didn't know what a minority was. What's a minority? Do you know one of them said, a child, someone who is not an adult. I said, no, 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 not a minor, a minority. Then one of them said, the people who work like underneath the ground, I said, no, that's a minor, E-R versus a minor, O-R. I said, a minority, 
and I spelled it for them. Hey, Sister Carla, I spelled it, a minority. What's a minority? They did not know. These are seventh and eighth graders. They did not know what a minority was. At first I stood kind of com uh, perplexed. Hmm, they don't know what a minority is. And then immediately I thought, that might be good. That might be good that they don't know what a minority is because that means that they have no concept of someone discriminating against them, someone treating them less because they are a female or they are an African-American or a Latino or an Asian or an Indian. And one thing about Pike Township, particularly in the middle schools, it is very evident the diversity, the diversity is you can literally be in a class with young people from the Ivory Coast, from Ghana, from Guinea, from uh, Nigeria, from uh, Australia, from Venezuela. You can literally sit in a class with young people from the Dominican Republic, from Israel, from other places in the Middle East. There is such diversity in Pike. And so I often challenge these young people to diversify their friendships. Your friendships should not be uh, with people who only look like you. And so today I pose this question to them, not only the diversity question, but I pose this thought to them, which was from President Obama's speech last night, that his second point was that he believed that racism was still well and alive and one of the primary issues of our country. I asked him if they felt that that was true, and they said, uh, maybe, yeah, because black men are getting killed for no reason, but that's the only place that they see racism. I said, okay, seventh and eighth grade, got TV, got the internet, but that's the only place, so okay. And so I said to them, I honestly believe that it can be this generation of young people, this generation of young people that can kill, snuff out racism. I honestly believe that. Because of simply what they are exposed to, you literally can have a friend a classmate sitting next to you and their parents are from China, their parents are from Japan, their parents are from the Ivory Coast, their parents are from the Dominican Republic, their, fr their, their parents are from Venezuela. They're not just from here in Indianapolis, 56th and Georgetown, or 38th and Lafayette Road. Hallelujah. They can actually begin to diversify their friendship, which will begin to snuff out and kill racism. I believe it can be this generation just from the opportunity of them being exposed to other communities and cultures. And so I'm having this conversation with one of the administrators and they make this statement about the opportunities that are now being afforded to African Americans, and I had to remind him that that may be true, but racism and bigotry and discrimination is still well, alive and well. However, when you have a group of young people, seventh and eighth graders, who don't even know what it means to be a minority, there's a positive about that because that means that somewhere in their mind, they think I can do anything, just like the three women in Hidden Figures. I encourage them, tell your family, your mother, take, take you to the movies to see this movie, to be encouraged. And so I, I share with them, I said, look around the room uh, at one of my schools yesterday. There was not one class, hear me beloved, there was not one class that had a Caucasian male in it. Not one. Six classes, 25 to 30 young people each. Not one of them, none of my groups, had a Caucasian young man in it. So I said to them, look around this room. Everyone in this room is a minority. They were like, no, there are white people in here. 
white girls. I said, no, 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 they're minorities too, as a female. I explained to the Latino young people that when these girls went to school in the uh, 1800s, because that's when it was, when, when the role that uh, Sister Pete plays, Taraji plays, uh, that sister went to Wilberforce in 18, I want to say she graduated in either 1849 or 1869, somewhere in there. Um, 18, well, whatever it was, whatever school. So she, um, she's 98 years old today. And I said, so when historically black colleges were created, there were really no Spanish, Latino, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Spanish speaking people here in this country. So there was no need to have universities and schools that were just for you, but to help him, them to understand why historically black colleges were necessary. And those were the choices that these women had afforded to them. And that's where they went and that's where they graduated from and that's where they pledged. And their brilliance was cultivated under the, in the walls of African-American historically black colleges and universities. Oh, don't sell them out, honey, because many of us went, and I encourage our young people to go, at least undergrad, right? Now, grad, you can go wherever you want, but the experience of that historically black college experience. And so, I find it interesting that our young people do not know what it means to be a minority. The disadvantage to not knowing what it means to be a minority is that when they encounter the challenges of this world because they are a minority, they may not understand how to handle it. One of the young people said to me, so how do we kill racism, stop racism, when we have yeah, 1949. Thank you, sis. I said 1849. 1949 was when she graduated. Thank you. That's my sister. Um, she said, how do we kill racism when we have a president like President-elect Trump? I said, well, what does he have to do with the three people that are sitting in this row who look nothing alike, who are from their parents and their family and their, their, their history is from different parts of this world. He has nothing to do with that. Now, it is your responsibility that when it's time to elect another president, you don't elect someone that you feel the way that you feel about president-elect. And so that is my lesson for today, even to us as adults. Diversify your friendship base. We want to kill racism. We want people to, to understand our plight, our pain, to appreciate it, to empathize with it. They can't sympathize because they'll never uh, put themselves in our, in our place. They can't get in our skin. The quote that uh, President Obama did last night, they can't get in our skin. They really can't walk in our shoes. We don't want nobody painting their fla faces black, right? It's no different than... Uh, a woman trying to help her husband to understand what it feels like to have a baby or to have cramps. He ain't going to get it. <laughs> but if you can communicate, if you can diversify, not your business base, but your friendship base, and help each other to have dialogue. I, I had a young woman tell me after I did a training with her company, and we sat down and she talked about her black friend who uh distanced herself from her when she told her she had voted for um, Trump. And her friend couldn't understand, how could you do that? You have, I'm your black friend, you have black friends, and you know how he talks to and treats women, and you know about his, what he did with Central Park Five and wouldn't let uh, African Americans live in his buildings, and how he discriminated against his employees, uh, Latino employees in his hotels, and all of these different things. How could you do that? And she just couldn't understand why her black friend was so defensive. And so what I said to her was, consider this. A young white man walks into a church on a Wednesday and kill, has dialogue with nine African-American people worshiping God and kills them. And his purpose was to create a race war. 
He kills them and he has no remorse, he says, when he goes to trial. But that day, when he's arrested, on his way to booking, they take him to Burger King. I said, and literally within several weeks of that, a young man is standing in the middle of a highway. His car is broke down. He and others have called the police for help. He has his hands up. From a helicopter, you hear someone say, he looks like a bad guy. How can you tell that he looks like a bad guy hundreds of feet in the air? But he leaves that scene dead on a stretcher. And we can talk about these situations. And so the young lady who was in my training course, she said, I never saw it that way. I said, and all your friend wants you to do is to empathize with her. It's the husband who's holding his hand, the hand of his wife at the bedside when she's about the birthday baby. He can't sympathize because the baby's not in him. You don't have to push him out. You don't have the contractions. You don't know what it feels like to have a whole nother human being inside of you. But you can empathize. You can get into the space of my pain and hear me and hold my hand through the process. And that's all your friend wanted you to do was to feel her pain of what it's like to be an African-American in this country. And you tell me you're voting for a man who has seemingly communicated his disdain for people who are not like him and even you as a woman. And so this is what we must do as a community and as a culture. This is what we must do. We must broaden our friendship base. If we want to kill racism in our